Good morning, good morning. Hey, you know what? It is June. It is June 2022. Can you believe that? How many of y'all remember the 1990s? You remember, you remember being in like eighth grade in the 90s or I don't know, whatever you were in 1994 or whatever, two or whatever it was. And you're like, man, I will never be 16, you know? It's like, it takes, it takes forever to be 16. It takes forever to graduate high school. Some of those of you are in school today. Remember how long the days were in school? Oh, gosh. And that was the 90s. We were like, man, 2000s will never come. And here we are 22 years later. Yeah, okay, good. All right, good morning. Gosh. It's summertime, people. If you have your Bible, let's turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. It's summertime. It's summertime. This, of course, June is the month we celebrate Father's. We have Father's Day coming up. If you haven't been reminded, June 9th. Uh, not 9th. What is it? 19th. That's what I meant. June 19th is Father's Day. Things that I like is your spiritual father. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no? Okay. June, June 19th, Father's Day. This month we're celebrating our fathers, and I wanted to dive in and look at the supreme, the best, the ultimate, the penultimate father of all time, God Almighty himself, right? Abba, Father. And just to focus on what, uh, who Jesus was and who the Father was, and to think about what that means for us and how we could be like him, right? How we could be good fathers. You're like, well, I'm a woman. I can't be a father. That's right. We are not fluid in that sense. But we can all learn from what it means to be a good father and apply that to our lives. Can I get an amen? amen? And so we spent last month looking at women. And we saw some really awesome women of God in Scripture. And we saw not just, you know, not just meek, mild, you know, dainty little women. We saw women that were queens that rose up and used their status and their prestige. They used their power to save people. They used their radical, bold voice to make a difference in the world. Wasn't that awesome? We saw a Samaritan woman as the first preacher. She, she like Pentecostal style, right? Uh, those Pentecostals back in the day were some of the first to have preachers that were women. And uh, the Samaritan woman goes back to the village and she tells everybody. Everybody knows. And so we saw this, this, this woman, a Samaritan woman, who has a sordid past and has uh, ch- challenges in her, in, her, in her history and her race and her ethnicity and her gender, and yet God uses her to bring about good news to others. Isn't that awesome? And so we realize that we don't have to have just prestige and power. We don't have to have the perfect background to be, you know, little saintly nuns to grow up. We can, we can have a past and still talk to Jesus. Isn't that good news? Yeah, so now we're going to move into um, to the baptismal story of Jesus, where it's the first occasion in the Gospels where we see God in, from, from the heavens speak to his people. And uh, this has just been really fascinating to me. I hope that you get as much out of it as I have. When I think about, I was talking to some people this week, so don't think that I prepped this just for you, but maybe God prepped it for us together. But uh, I was texting with a, a friend of mine and thinking about the questions through about, you know, what does it mean to talk to God? And, and how come God is silent sometimes? And how come God talks to everybody else but me sometimes? Anybody ever feel that way? How many times do you feel like, well, if he's a good God and he wants to be engaged and he wants to talk to me, then why does it seem so hard to hear him? And why is he sometimes so silent? Y'all ever had those questions? These are some of the questions, by the way, we talked about last week. We said, hey, look, those are good and acceptable questions to bring to God. And so as I think about those things and, and I think about this text, it's been really interesting to think about this question. How many times does God speak in the way that we want him to every time? How many times does God speak like that through Scripture? Now, of course, now let's, let's put a little caveat here. We all know that God is always speaking, Amen. right? Amen. His Word, He's always speaking to us. We know that God always speaks, and, and as Paul says in Romans 1 and, and other places, that behold the glories of God, right? That His, his Son and the stars and the moon, the, the Grand Canyon, His creation speaks and declares who God is, right? So God uses natural things to speak to us. God uses sometimes, you know, dorky, uh, sinful pastors like me, right? Sometimes, every once in a while. Jimmy's eyes got big. He's like, we're going to really need a miracle. (laughs) Thanks, Pastor Jimmy. Brother Jimmy, not Pastor Jimmy. Yes, so God uses all kinds of things, but we're talking about not just when God uses those things, but like, I don't know about you, I sometimes just want, hey, just God, make it easy. 
Like, I, I want that, that, uh, that, that, that thunder in the sky. I, I want that burning bush. Like, I want something that goes, not, not, not even, I don't even want it to be a sign. I don't want it to be a fleece, so to speak. I want, I don't want the audible voice of God. Anybody out there who want that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, you, if you're saying, man, I don't, I, don't know about, I don't know about that, Dale. Well, then wait until, like, real tragedy comes. Wait until you're scared to death. Wait till you're not sure what to do. All of a sudden, you remember those kinds of prayers, right? Yeah. And remember how we bargain and barter with God? You know, I'll give you the rest of my life, God, if you just tell me, you know. <laughs> I'll never do that again, God. Just say the word, you know. Anybody, anybody barter with God? Yeah. Okay, I'm glad y'all were honest today. I like that. It's not just me. I'm, I, you know, I play cards with God, like call your bluff. Let's go. I mean, where you at? <laughs> lay, lay down. I call. I want to see. Yeah, and, that, and so I was thinking about this. It's, it's interesting, the Gospels, because there's only two occasions in all of the Gospels that God speaks in that way. Now, of course, we know Jesus is God, right? And so Jesus is always speaking throughout the Gospels. But when I think about the Father speaking, the way that when I'm like, man, I need an answer. Which job should I take? Or, you know, who do I kick out of the church? Or, oh, no, that's not the question I'm asking. <laughs> Just, just, tell me the, just tell me that, God. Just show it. Just show it. Make it, make it clear. When, when I think about those kinds of requests, like that kind of expectation I have of God, I go, okay, where in Scripture is that expectation filled? It's only filled twice in the Gospels or in two stories. One of them, of course, is the baptismal story, right? Everyone go, no, duh. No, good job. I'm making sure you're on page with me. The other one is in the latter part of John in chapter 12, and, and God speaks again, and he, and he actually affirms Jesus again. But when you think about this, this is a big deal, right? So here's where we are in the story. 400 years of silence is how theologians think about it. From the end of Malachi to the ushering in of Jesus, there's been 400 years of silence. 400 years. There's no book between Malachi and Matthew, right, chronologically speaking. And in the biblical sense, right? And so for 400 years, the children of Israel had been asking the question, where is God? Now think about that, right? Because I don't know about you, but maybe, maybe you can relate to this. I can get really irritable with the Lord. I can get kind of cranky, like, are you even real? You won't even answer my prayer. Am I the only one? Gets a little sassy. Like, God, where are you? If you're so loving, you're so good, I'm asking you, I'm doing all the right things. Like, say something. Imagine going 400 years. Now, when I say 400 years, I don't want you to think, okay, well, Methuselah lived 900 years. So that's not a bad, like once every 400, you know what I mean? No, we're talking, about, we're talking about entire generations that came and lived and died, never hearing a fresh voice of the Lord. I mean, think about it. Let's, let's, just, let's just say, I mean, uh, I don't think the average life expectancy back then was 100 years, but you know, let's go with 100. Let's say that would be four generations of everyone living to 100, of never hearing a fresh word, so to speak. Are you with me? Imagine how hard that is. You, you and I have scripture to like land on. They just had, had the old people telling them stories. And it's not even like, oh, well, well Moses, tell me that story again. Like, that guy is long dead. It's, it's not even like, well, can, can grandpa tell that story? No, because grandpa can only tell the stories he's heard because he hasn't, he hasn't spoken since Great, great, great grandpa. You follow me? So, I mean, it's not even like, you know, it's not, it's not like you, you went to the Braves game and you're like, man, you saw how they smoked the Dodgers? Oh, God. Got gotcha, your mic, got gotcha, your mic. You can't even relive it with people because you're only telling a story of a story. You ever, let me, let me put it this way. Have you ever had a moment where in your devotional time or your prayer time or maybe, maybe in, in listening to some, some worship where God just drops something on you and it is fresh and it is like, yes, gold. It is, yes, that, that just feeds me. Y'all ever had that moment? Have you ever taken that moment and shared it with somebody else? Like, I can remember a moment where I'm like sitting across from this guy at Waffle House. I'm like, no, man, this is what God showed me. And I am like... I'm ready. I'm climbing tables. Like, let's go. This is what God said to me. And I'm looking at him, and I'm realizing he's just going, uh-huh, yeah, cool. <laughs> no one ever gets your revelation the way that you get it. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Have you ever heard a pastor like me who you know, gets loud and it's, you know, all that stuff, and, and you're like, man, that's really good. Like, like I'm really getting what Dale's saying. I'm, 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 I'm getting what he's throwing down. Y'all get, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you ever go to work like one day or maybe school or somewhere or maybe you, you uh, are texting or somebody or something you go, man, Pastor Dale, man, the Lord just used him and he said this to me and it was awesome. And you look across and they're going, oh, yeah, it's good. It's good. 
And you know they don't get it the way that you get it, right? It's, it's almost like there's this weird like, um, dissipation of revelation. It's almost like when you get it, when I get it, man, it's, I'm, I'm going, man, this is really cool. This bad story is cool. Check it out. And I look at you all and you all go, oh, yeah, okay, maybe, you know. And then you, you go tell someone, they're like, yeah, that's, I'm not even sure that guy's of God. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's something about that. So imagine, like, the succession, right? Imagine you're generation number five, and God's been silent for 400 years. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking they're probably like, well, <laughs> we used to believe this old story. Well, we've, we've heard this thing. It might be even a myth. We're not really sure, but we don't, we're not, we don't hope it's not. You know what I'm talking about? I, I, I feel like sometimes that, that maybe, maybe uh, in this era, they're, they're going, yeah, we believe in God, and here's the old stories, but <sighs> it's kind of hard to say it out loud. Starting to lose a little confidence, a little trust in it. I, I'll tell you a modern-day example for me. I've been hearing all of my life, Jesus is coming again. Now, here, <laughs> I believe that. But there's a part of me, the chief sinner among us, right? I say that every Sunday now, I think. <laughs> there's a part of me that's like, yeah, I've said it so much, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Because mama said that, and grandmama said that, and great-grandma said that. It's starting to be like, eh. You know what I mean? Are we getting honest with each other, right? See, some of the time, I go deep. I try to get honest with you. So, here, so here's what we're saying. We're saying this, this is a day. On, on this day, this baptism day, we're talking about a people who have lived in 400 years of silence. There's a guy that had a, a, a song, and, and Mary, of course, had a vision. But prior to that, it's just been quiet. It's like, it's like when you're uh, seven years old, and it's time to go to bed, and the whole house is quiet, and all of a sudden, you are convinced you're going to die. <laughs> Because when things are quiet, they are scary. You ever feel like when God's quiet, life's just a little bit more scary? Yeah. That's what's going on here. That's, that's the climate of the era, is there's a little bit of uncertainty. Oh, we've been in bondage for a long time, and this ruler is really evil. He killed all of our two-year-old boys. It's a bad time. And you would think if he was a loving God, he would have saved us from that atrocity, that genocide, that awful thing. Where is he? He hasn't even spoken, much less saved our own babies. What is wrong? Where is this God? And then there's this guy named John the Baptist. And I have no idea why they thought this was necessary, but he was eating locusts and honey and wearing some really weird clothes. The dude's lost his mind. He's out in the wilderness, and he's preaching revival. Notice, notice this, because... Because if it was, this was me and we were like, okay, evangelism training 101, I would never tell you to go out to where no one's at to evangelize. <laughs> it is never a good evangelist strategy. Hey, Mets, you could either go to your campus, which would be awesome to reach people for Christ, or you could go to Arizona. <laughs> there are some people in Arizona, but not those places. Terrible major strategy, right? You don't go where no one's at. You go where everybody's at. But this guy's out there at the Jordan, at, at the desert, and he's preaching his heart out, and he's reminding everybody that, that, um, that God is coming and that Jesus is going to have his way. He's gonna, he hasn't said Jesus yet, but he's getting there. And this is, this is the passage. In John chapter 1, verse 29, read it with me. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, and I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remained. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. You'll remember in the Matthew and the Mark and the Luke accounts, God's Spirit's going to show up in, a, in the voice from heaven, and he's going to say, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. With that, may I pray with you. Jesus, I pray that this sermon would not just be eloquence or my intellect, God, but it be your word straight to us that we would get a grip on who you are as our Father 
In Jesus' name, amen. It's a big buildup because I want you to feel the tension. I want you to feel the tension. I want you to recognize, as I think, I don't know about you, but for me, I sometimes uh, can overly uh, uh, get fixated on needing to hear the voice of God. And here's what I noticed in this passage. It's so very ironic to me. Because in John's account, there's five verses, and we don't even see God directly speak from the heavens. In the Matthew account, it's five verses. Or sorry, Luke's account, I think it's, maybe it's Matthew. I'm confused now. Don't worry. Just trust me. It's one of them is five. <laughs> two or five verses, and the other two are like three verses. Think about that. If, if, think about if you were going to write and craft a book about God and his son, and there was a part of the story where God speaks from heaven, wouldn't you think you'd have more to say than five sentences? <laughs> five verses. If there was a day in your life, and maybe there has been, I hope that there is, if there isn't, I hope you have one. Has there been a day in your life where you go, man, on that day, God said this to me. I hope you would tell it in more than five sentences. There's something about this a little bit ironic. There's something about this that challenges me. It's something about, it, this, it's, not, it's, it's clearly an important moment for Jesus, an important moment that God speaks. And yet it's not as, um, I don't know, it, it doesn't feel as grand as I would expect it. I would expect, like, and then the whole multitudes fell out in the spirit, <laughs> you know, like, and then everyone got saved. I would, I would expect, like, and no one had heard his voice like that, and, and this is how it sounded, and this is what we heard, and this is how we experienced. I would think the, the writer would go through intentionality to, to make this, this voice of God like a really, really big deal, and yet it's kind of minimal. Isn't that intriguing to you? No, Okay. Talk to me. Use your face. This is, yes. My first takeaway from this is that sometimes we overemphasize our need to hear God. And we underemphasize what God's voice, when God's voice, how God's voice, and where God's voice comes. We sometimes, we, we, we put ourselves almost, we almost kind of do a slight change of hands or like a magic trick. And we, we slide into the, the throne. We go, man, if I was God, then I would, I would speak about people like this and like that. It's like a, it's like a really, really uh, small shift in how we posture ourselves. And we can, even in the asking and, and the, the posture, man, why, God, why? Sometimes we can find ourselves expecting God to act as we act rather than being committed to listening to God, being committed to, to pursuing, being committed, being open, rather than, than maybe um, finding obedience despite his voice or the lack of his voice. Here's what I notice, if you'll look with me, in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized immediately, he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Here's what I noticed. I want you to catch this. The first thing is that I'm going to try to, try to lane it a little better than I did the first go around. Sometimes we overemphasize our need for God's voice when we need to emphasize our obedience and our listening. We, I think, I don't know about you, but... Um, Oftentimes, we, when we reflect on our lives and reflect on the lives of, the, of those heroes of the faith, including Jesus in Scripture, we get the high points of their lives, and it feels like the high points of their lives is their whole life. Let me say it again. Sometimes when we reflect on people in Scripture, we see the highlights of their lives, and we see the highlights of their life as their whole life. So we're like, man, I want to live a life like Peter. You know, Peter is casting out demons and seeing people sick and who made whole. And Peter does this and that and the other. But what we don't see is the every day of Peter. What we want is, you know, I want God to speak to me like, Mo like he did Moses in that burning bush. That was one day, one time. 
How long did that guy live? How long did he live before that one bush? And how long did he live after? But there's something about how we interpret the scripture, how we, how we process it, how we, we make it inside of us. And we, we think, well, it's, it's as if all of these en- encounters are like the every day. They're not the every day. I sure wish it was the every day. Now, I'll, I'll always tell you what I don't know. I don't know why God doesn't do it every day. Anybody know why? I know that we all wish it was every day. Can I get an amen? And, and, but I'm not God. I don't know his motives. I know he's good. I know he's kind. I know he's present. I know he's with you. I don't know why it's not always obvious. Maybe we could, maybe we could, maybe we could, we could answer it this way. Where we're just not listening. Maybe. Or maybe he just didn't speak for 400 years. I don't know. And I, I offer that to you because I think sometimes pastors don't want to tell you what they don't know. But I want you to, I want you to recognize that that's, that's part of the human struggle. It's part of the human dynamic of faith is to go, I don't know. And the beauty of that, by the way, and it's difficult to swallow this, the beauty of that is, and that's why we call it faith. <laughs> I, wish, I wish it wasn't that. It'd be really great, wouldn't it? You get up, well, Lord, it's Monday. It's your day. Tell me what you want. You know, you're brushing your teeth, and all of a sudden a voice comes from heaven. This is what you're going to do today. This is how you're going to do it. Oh, man. I tell, I tell people uh, when, they, when they come to work for me, I go, hey, listen, the first thing you know about me is I am not a good micromanager. And when I used to be at that early days, they would, they would all be like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. I know. You know, no one likes someone over the top of their shoulder. Can I get a witness? You know what I've come to learn? We all love micromanagers. I've come to learn that. I've come to learn, maybe not your micromanager, but I've come to learn that we like to know what people expect of us. And I have seen staff of mine who have floundered because they didn't know how to take initiative. They didn't know how to get it done. They needed me to, 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 to calculate it all the way out for them. Well, first mistake, I'm not even good at that. <laughs> I'm, ask Adam. I'm good at initiating and just taking action. But when I'm doing it, things are going to fall and things are going to get broken. That's just how it is. You don't want me to micromanage your life. There's something about micromanaging. What micro, what the, 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 the thing behind micromanaging is that you know what's expected of you. Don't, wouldn't it be great to know every day what God expects of you? Oh, it'd be so much easier. Oh, man. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes you go through life, you go, man, am I missing it? Oh, I would love not to have that, that doubt. The irony here I'm trying to point out is that it's not the every day. Let me say it this way. It's not the every day for even Jesus to hear from heaven. And yet he says later on, I look to see where the Father is at work and I work alongside of him. In other words, we love to hear the voice of God, but sometimes the voice of God is not thundering from the sky, although we wish it would every time. The The thundering of the voice is oftentimes in his book, Oftentimes in listening, oftentimes it's in nature, oftentimes it's just in your perseverance and obedience of walking in the faith. And no one said amen to that. That's a hard one to swallow, isn't it? And the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, and coming to rest on him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Another thing that I noticed... So the first thing I notice is that God isn't speaking from heaven every day to to Jesus. The next thing I notice in this passage, oh, I lost my train of thought. That's rare. (laughs) Ah! I don't know about you. I am most likely to beg God for his voice when everything is a muck. When everything's going wrong, it is like God speak. I need a financial miracle. I need a health miracle. I need a relational miracle. I need all the miracles. Anybody like that? Like, this is a grand time to say something, God. Like, this is, like, on spot. Like, as the kids say in the streets, on God. Like, that's not how you use it, I don't think, but I just did. Like, this is the moment. I have never never won the lottery. But I imagine if I won the lottery, I wouldn't be like, well, Lord, can you speak to me now? Oh, man. I'd be on Amazon.com. I would like to pay off my mortgage. 
I no longer work for you. <laughs> Take this job, man. Okay, watch it, watch it. Especially if you work for me, Lily. No one ever wins the lottery and goes, God, where are you? Speak to me. It's always when we're in the mess of life that we're like, God, I can use your voice now. But guess, but look where Jesus is at. Jesus is walking in the wilderness to go get baptized. He is, he's not knocking on death's door. He's not looking at a cross. He, he's not looking at soldiers. It's, it's a good day. He's going to, he's going to, to, to participate in this act called baptism that, that John the Baptist is leading and that Jewish people have been doing for some time. And so it's not like he's having his hardest day that God speaks. He's having a great day. Isn't it wild, right? We expect God to speak to us on our worst days, and he spoke to Jesus on his best day. We got to think about that. So maybe we could, you know, we could sort of, if we want to think about Jesus as our model, we can go, man, maybe I shouldn't just be asking for God's voice on my worst day, but also on my best days. So, so God speaks, right? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. There's so much to gather out of this back to our idea, father-like. There's so much to gather out of this little phrase about who God is. Ultimately, we want to answer this question this month is, who is God? What's he like? Who is this God and what is he like? And then what how should we live and how can we connect to such a God? The first thing I want you to notice is that God shows up to Jesus in Jesus' obedience. God shows up. The Father shows up in Jesus' obedience. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Don't you love that? Because so oftentimes as parents, I get in the trap too, parents. It's easy to get... Uh, bothered by or annoyed by or, or, or only focus on our kids' misbehaviors. It is, it is easy to correct a six-year-old all day, every day. Can I get a witness? It's e- no? It's easy to spank a two-year-old all day, every day. Can I get a witness? No, we don't spank. Okay, timeouts. Y'all know three, three Nangers? You ever heard of Three Nangers? It is easy as parents to just get into the place of always critiquing and always prompting your child to do better. And it's, it's sometimes difficult to remember the place of affirmation. At a boy, at a girl, great job. And I love that on this occasion, God's not showing up to give instructions. He's not telling Jesus how to better live or, hey, you know, you did that batch was awesome. Make sure you do this tomorrow, you know. Took out the trash today, good job. He's showing up and affirming affirming, affirming. What kind of affirmation does he do? It's not just that he's affirming. He's affirming as his beloved son, my beloved son. I have been working hard lately. I don't know if my family's picked up on it, but I've been working on uh, affirming my kids, especially, and my wife, especially. But not just like, good job, you're doing awesome, but affirming them in our identity as a family unit affirming them in our family as their identity, in our family unit as their identity. You follow me? In other words, we can sometimes, as Americans, we can be so over-individualistic, and we can put kids in the, well, you know, find out who you are. And we give so much freedom to this, this idea of search for meaning and personhood that I think that's why we're having some of the struggles we're having as a, as a generation. Some of the struggles of who am I and what's my gender and what's my identity and my ethnicity, and my personhood, my da 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 da. Some of that 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 uh, estrangement and some of that disfracturing, not disfracturing, fracturing, is because I don't think we are we are bonding people into who we are. And so I love that God doesn't just say, "Man, good job." He says, "Good job, my beloved." There's a, there's, a, there's a role as a family and as a church family that we, we affirm one another in our identity. We affirm one another in our bonded collective identity. It's, it's great that we are a diverse country, and I love that we are a diverse church. 
That's, that is awesome. That is like my dream of, of the kingdom is diversity. Can I get a witness? And by the way, we don't just mean color. We mean ideas. And we mean uh, uh, paths to God and all those kinds of things. We're not talking about, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, radical things. We're talking about just d- diversity in persons united by Jesus. In one faith, in one Lord, in one baptism. And so as a part of that bonded as, as, as family units, as church units, is to affirm. Affirm one another. It's not just, oh, that person goes to my church. Well, that's, you know, in the old days we'd say, brother, <laughs> sister. When we've got to find ways to affirm one another, to encourage one another, that's the kind of God we serve. Is the one that calls you, not servant, but child. Not just the child or a child or the stepchild. You're the beloved. You're his. We are his. And a voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I love. The father shows up first and foremost in Jesus' day of obedience. Secondly, the father affirms. The father affirms. The father affirms. For every critique we appropriately make about our children, we better follow it up with a lot of attaboys and attagirls. Whenever we are discipling and mentoring others and we, we confront and we challenge, it ought to be followed up with some attaboys and some attagirls. I, I have uh, long believed that you can say anything to anybody, but it's not just how you say it. It's the tone. It's the way. It's the mannerisms the volume, it's all those things. It's also in how you connect and bring them in. My beloved son. You can hear in this my connection, there's a natural bonding that the father is doing. Jade and Soraya, you may know, my two oldest daughters are adopted. And as you might imagine, as adoptive parents, we were a little concerned, like, well, how do, you, how do you connect, and how do you bond, and how do you attach, and, you know, how do you love? And as you might imagine, when you have natural children, you have kind of nine months to grow into learning how to bond to that little, that little thing, right? Those early days, just a couple of cells, and then it multiplies, and you're hearing the heartbeat, and you're, 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 you're learning to love this new thing inside of you as this new thing is growing, right? You get kind of a, a little of a little uh, leeway with, from cell to brain to, you know, heart, right? But when you adopt kids who are, you know, nine and five, it's like, how do you do that, you know? And so we, we learn, like, the, the role of the intentionality of attaching and bonding to your children. We learn that you can learn to love anyone. We learn that there's little techniques, and I'm not saying that you all should be doing this in the church per se, at least not the way we did it, but we used to, Jade, every night we would, we would put lavender uh, lotion on Jade's feet and rub her feet because that's a, a way to connect and bond with a child. Well, you would use aroma, you would use lotion, and you would use a, a part of the body that's non-sensual in order to connect and to attach and to bond. And so we would do that every night. And you know what we learned? We love them. We love them. Now, I can say that better than anybody in the room, well, except for Andrea, because I've now had a natural child and an adopted child, and we love them. We love them. In the same way, God, the Father, loves you. He's already attached to you. That's the beauty about attachment, right? is it's, it's not just one way, it's both ways. And, and as you might imagine, um, it takes two people in that relationship to bond to one another. And the, the beautiful thing is that God, God has birthed you. And so he already has that kind of affection, affinity, and admiration, that kind of like, uh, uh, you know, adornment of you. You're already like his prized possession. Now it's just like our journey and our life to learn to adore him. To learn to bond to him, to connect, and to attach. The last thing I want to offer you is that this Father in heaven not only speaks, he also attaches and bonds. He also gives. And on this occasion, he's going to give his very best, his son. 
To be a good father is to give gifts. To be, to be a good, good father, it's not just gifts. When I say gifts, I don't just mean presence, although sometimes it does mean that. I don't just mean affirmation. It often means affirmation. I, 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 it doesn't always just mean like uh, um, quality time. It means all of it. I was saddened thinking today because once upon a time you could look into media, you could look at heroes in our history, and you could say, well, that man was a good father. And, and man, that's a, that's a good image of father. And it's kind of almost sad to think about, we would oftentimes in my era, in the era of TV and technology, we often point to like not real dads, but who are real dads, right? Let me give you a great example of a great father growing up, Bill Cosby. Like he was the best of fathers. He's not even a real person. <laughs> He's a, he's a figure. And, and, and you think about we now what we know about Mr. Cosby and, and, and the allegations and the, and the uh, charges and, and, the, and the guilty plea. You, you, even our, our best uh, uh, media portrayal of a father has fallen short. And so we used to say, man, it's hard to understand the love of a father because there's just not any good fathers out there to even look to, Right? And so we fall short on understanding what it means to have a good and loving father. But make no mistake, though you and I may not have perfect fathers, biologically speaking, you have a heavenly father who has never missed the mark. You have a heavenly father that calls you beloved. You have a heavenly father who loves you so much that he sent his very best son for you and me to die on a cross. If you bow your heads and close your eyes. Father-like, living with the Father, living like the Father. What I hope you capture today is that even Jesus didn't hear a voice from heaven every day. And yet he proclaimed, like his, his, Jesus said, how much more does the Father in heaven love you? So church, you may not get a voice from heaven Every day or any day the rest of your life. And yet you're still called to obedience, to live like Jesus, and love like Jesus. And even though you might not get that thunder in the cloud, it doesn't mean that God's not good. He is. He's so good that he gave Jesus. That's how good he is. I can offer you a lot of things from myself to, to, to communicate to you how much I care for you as a church. As, a, as friends to me. I could give you birthday cards and give you a birthday gift. You could come to me in your dark hour. I could try to give you some finances to help out. I could try to, try to fix things for you if, that, if you need those things. I can, I can do all of those things, but if you were to ask, you've asked me, Dale, come over and fix my fan. I'm going to try my best and say yes and then come over and fix the fan. But if you ask me for Vera's life, I really love you, but I don't know that I can offer you that. And yet Jesus was sent by your heavenly father. The Hebrew would have said, Abba, Daddy. Abiel, my God. On this day, church, we're going to take communion. If you'll grab the cup behind you or below you. Thank you. This cup. represents Jesus' body and his blood. Your very best. His, his very best son came to have his body broken for you. If you take out that bread, with your eyes bowed and your hand lifted high with that bread, and if you just, just break it, it's Jesus' body broken for you. And on the night he was betrayed, he He lifted it up and he gave thanks. God, we thank you for the bread of life, your body. We thank you, Father. We thank you that you loved us enough to send us your son. Father, we thank you that you sent us your word. You sent us creation to remind us of how good you are and how grand and how big you are, how powerful you are. You You've given us certain moments in our lives where the Spirit has spoken to us, and we know that you are real. We thank you for every word. God, we thank you for Scripture as a story, as a history, 
as a testament to your goodness. God, this day, we take the body and we say thanks. Church, may take that bread. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood that's been poured out for you. He raises it up and he gives thanks over it. Imagine that. Picture it with me. Jesus knows his body is about to be splayed open, poured out, and he raises his cup and gives thanks. God, all of us in this room have different tests and trials before us. We're grateful that you poured out your blood, that in our trials, we may have inner life. That in our trials, when we pass from this life to the next, we will meet you because you died for us. So we take this cup this day and we say thank you. In your name, amen. Church may take. With your hands open, one more prayer of you. God, it's our heart. It's our earnest desire to be filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, to know your voice and to hear your voice. God, I pray that like Jesus, we would be faithful and obedient all the way through from beginning to end. And God, we ask that when your voice speaks, that we may have the ears to hear, the mind to listen, and the will to obey. In your name we pray. Amen. Church, would you just give a hand to Jesus?